it's always interesting to give a talk in, in the new place uh, for me and uh, in a new audience. And uh, today I will try to convince you uh, in some uh, usefulness of the construction that was developed in uh, more or less last decade. And it already has many names, but I prefer uh, the name of topological recursion. Uh, I would start with some example of this construction. Actually, this, uh, the example from which it was originally formulated. And uh, after it was originally formulated uh, for actually Hermitian one matrix models, I also spent some time uh, describing what, the, what uh, these matrix models are uh, and why they can be useful in different branches of uh, physics and mathematics. And then uh, I will, and this is actually to, to, it's done, it works, uh, no? Ah, uh, huh? We have a pointer somewhere. Ah, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, actually, possibly this one will be my main message today. Because all the rest, uh, it's just to convince you in, uh, in that this topological recursion Already, uh, have already found many applications in solving many problems of very different sort, combinatorial problems of mathematics, uh, not probably so much in physics, but however, uh, solving some problems of uh, uh, quantum two-dimensional gravity. And uh, uh, so, and these uh, three parts, the remaining parts, uh, actually are some generalizations of the main technique that uh, was again elaborated for solving matrix models. Now it's applied to solving many combinatorial problems, not necessarily related to any matrix model. Uh, but that's I hope to show you in what follows. So, uh, so I start with uh, some very short indeed very short description of what matrix models originally were. It was all started, uh, actually it was start, uh, if we consider it, it goes back to Wigner distribution laws, but in application to gravity, it was probably Toft who proposed to consider the following picture. So imagine that we have a two-dimensional surface. We have, uh, and we have some metric on this surface, and we approach this metric by uh, splitting this surface into triangles. And then we want to consider some integral over all possible uh, metrics. Of course, it's uh, always ill-defined. So we have many ways of defining this in this integration and one of possible ways and possibility shows that indeed uh, it has some advantages is to consider uh, this splitting into triangles that is encoded in what is called the matrix integral. So it's an integral over Hermitian matrix H of size n times n with some potential. Well, again, uh, usually at the beginning, we people started with potentials of some fixed form. For instance, for, train, for basically the triangulation, we have a potential with only quadratic and cubic term. But today, I will consider actually potentials of any order. Sometimes I will assume that this potential is polynomial, like here. Well, sometimes we can even refrain from this restriction and consider some rational functions and may and you'll see probably some other functions as well. But what is in the core of this integral is that if we develop 
the free energy, then contributions of different topologies, for instance, here is the topology of genus 2, come with different factors of n. So if we develop uh, the partition function of this, uh, the free energy, so the logarithm of partition function, into a series in n, then we obtain, then we split between contributions coming from different genus surfaces. I will tell you, this, this, uh, this is uh, actually on the first slide, this is what is called the, general, the beta ensemble. So beta uh, pertains to the uh, power of Vandermond. Again, so that I will show. So, uh, so because this is of course for the very, very first example. It's, uh, the first solution was by Brizan, it's Exxon, Paris, and Zuber in 78, where they found the contributions of genus 0 and 1, and then it's all developed into the whole machinery. Yes, yes, yes. It's actually, we'll see that it's, uh, uh, speaking in physical terms, uh, it's a sort of uh, semi-classical expansion. So, uh, and again, what, what was so attractive with these matrix models, first of all, of course, they look, well, they look very simple. It's just, uh, there is no space variables, nothing. It's just integrals over matrices. So it's always just finite fault integration in principle. However, uh, they unify many interesting properties. Even if you consider some uh, Kansevich matrix model, and I will show you what is it in what follows, uh, then this Kansevich matrix model, it's, uh, it's simplicity about of the same sort as the original matrix model. Uh, but it produced tau function like KDV hierarchy. So amazingly enough, these integrals, they also satisfy some nonlinear equations, nonlinear hierarchy equations with respect to this times that we have here. And uh, it was quite amazing and, uh, well, the Kansevich finally, <laughs> at least, it was he heavily weighted its Fields medal, <laughs> this Kansevich matrix model. And at the same time, this uh, model produced intersection indices, so these are, these are, we consider, correlation functions of quantum two-dimensional gravity with matter. Uh, if we consider some uh, more uh, involved two matrix models, for instance, like uh, which have this interaction, then we can adjust these models to consider the critical behavior of conformal models, of conformal PQ series. Say the example is one matrix model, it's always uh, for Q equal to, but in principle we are able to consider all P and Q. Uh, uh, and, and again we have the beta ensemble models where we don't, sometimes we do have a matrix model representation, sometimes we don't, not for all betas we have it, only for three values of beta we have the corresponding matrices, but in principle we can consider this n-fold integration and we can uh, consider again some expansion in 1 over n for the free energy of these models and it uh, actually encoded many interesting things. It, uh, it appears in the description of quantum Hall effect and in the more modern AGT correspondence between conformal blocks of quantum Liouville theory and uh, and these beta ensemble and these beta ensemble integrals. Yes. Uh, well, this is this stands for uh, this nomenclature of. Uh, 
of exceptional. So it's uh, in uh, in in uh, I think yes for minimal models. Minimal models are labeled by P and Q for prime numbers. No, it's just uh, you know it's uh, again we. I don't expect that everyone understand uh, because I will not talk about this. I will talk basically about the technique, the technique that unify all this into one block that we can use to actually to solve all these models. But before I will describe the technique itself, uh, let's spend some time on uh, describing what are actually main objects. Main objects of investigation for me today will be the correlation function. So it will be not the free energy itself or the partition function Z, but uh, these means. They also have a name of loop means loop because if we expand this into parts of H, we obtain, of course, uh, uh, all powers of H weighted with X, and this correspond to insertion in the original picture to insertion of, uh, so if we have H to the power N, then it corresponds to insertion of loop of length N into the original pattern on the Riemann surface, well, on the triangulated Riemann surface. But again, it's just um, terminology. What, uh, so these correlation functions, they are generating functions for this all means, loop means, and M apparently stands for the number of these loops that we insert on the corresponding surface. And uh, what is also good is that these correlation functions also admit the expansion into 1 over N. So we can again distinguish between contributions of uh, different genus in this play. Yes, yes, it's um, it's the same as a, it's just because uh, here you, well, let me nevertheless draw the picture. <laughs> so it's, uh, the picture is oops, that we have this triangulation, no, 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 I think it's fine. Uh, so triangulation correspond to vertices of some sort of order three, and insertion of the loop mean h to the power n correspond to insertion of the vertex of order n here. But uh, this n comes it's just other characteristics. So we have one over n standing with each vertex. We have, uh, sorry, not one over n, n. N factor with each vertex, one over n with each propagator, and n with each phase. So the total factor will be n to the power number of uh, vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces and this is probably known that this is an other characteristic of the corresponding triangulation. It doesn't depend on anything but but the genus of this surface. So it's it's n two minus two j. Yes, yes. All this comes to the exponent because we consider the connected graphs. So connected graphs is, is a contribute to the free energy. This one. Ah, yes. So this, this means that, uh, just that means that we mark some vertices. So some vertices that comes from this because Again, this trace 1 over x minus h is obviously sum h to the power n, x minus 1 minus n. And we have a 
also factor. Well, it's uh, well we must follow it. It's uh, here the factor of n is such that uh, the expansion starts with just one. So, but in principle we just have we just label some vertices, so it doesn't affect the other characteristic. It doesn't so because this uh, formula just is just preserved. And this was again, this was um, just a great guess by Tov that we can use. We can use this to produce this genus expansion. Why I don't call it genus expansion? Because uh, we'll, we'll also have other other notion of genus in what follows. So, so I prefer to call it one over n expansion. But oh, again, in the original papers uh, that goes back to 80s and 90s, it was often also called genus expansion. Uh, okay, so uh, on the other hand, it was also known for ages, well, that instead of integrating over n square variables, we can reduce it to n-fold integration. Because obviously, all these traces, they are invariant under conjugation. So we must be able to integrate out angular degrees of freedom here. And when we integrate it out, we remain with just integrals over eigenvalues of this Hermitian matrix. But the, the wonder moment, uh, the uh, price for this is that, we, that uh, we have a Jacobian of this transition between two variables. And this Jacobian is this wonder moment square. Again, uh, I don't have time to, to to concentrate on the details of this. This is pretty much standard, but uh, this uh, means that we also we are also able to consider n-fold integration in the very same picture. So, and uh, actually, again, in many cases, this n-fold integration will be the basic one. So, and next is that I want also to have some operations that allows me to change these numbers, to pass from correlation function of order m to the correlation function of order m plus 1, and maybe, and maybe back. So I want to uh, invent, if you want, some uh, operations that correspond to insertion of this loop. And again, to insert this loop, it's uh, obviously not very difficult, because if we have this potential, these times, then I can always consider the differentiation with respect to these times, and then obviously just terms from uh, this potential, they come down to the, to the integration here. So, Again, it's useful to define what we call the loop insertion operator. And this is uh, this differential operator in these times acting on the whatever. So here it will act on the uh, correlation function. And actually it's also adapted to produce the connected part. So, so they will be again connected part of this correlation function because Obviously, we can say that, in principle, we can say that part of this comes from one uh, surface and part of this correlation function is defined on the other surface. But when we act by this operator, we are always on the same surface. Uh, okay. So, and again, it's obviously that we can produce this correlation function by action of this linear differential operator. Ah, that's uh, some uh, useful normalization. By uh, it happens it. And 
the main equation in the play the, that we want to solve is called the master loop equation. Uh, so, it, and it comes from just uh, stand, just uh, changing uh, by the standard changing of uh, integration variables. So, when we do this changing, of course, we assume, of course, we have some assumption. We assume that the integrals are convergent, so that we are able to integrate by parts on the way. But model of this, it's just a simple exercise uh, that shows us that we actually have exact equations that relates, say, in this case, one point correlation function with two point correlation function. Yes, lambdas are, I'm sorry, yes, lambdas are wise. Yes, it's, uh, unfortunately, the problem with y is that there will be some special y after that that we cannot change it. Uh, it's, well, so, some notations are, I must confess, they slightly inconvenient, but it's again, it's, uh, it was used in so many papers that now we cannot change it. Uh, yes, it's uh, not that difficult even to produce this equation if you want. Epsilon is a formal parameter. We consider the first or the correction of the first. Well, there is no correction because it's just a change of variables of integration. So, so in principle, this means that uh, there is the, the result is not changed under this. And we, we take just the first order, uh, first order correction in epsilon. So, and with the first order, we have this. Uh, X is formal variable, just formal, just com some complex number. No, 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 it just, it's just uh, any complex number. Actually, it's even uh, uh, assumed that this number is outside of the uh, domain of distribution of eigenvalues. So it's it's really complex. It's it's uh, it's it, it's not the it's not an eigenvalue, not at all. So uh, because it produces precisely what we had before. This loop means. Uh, I'm why? Uh, well, if we come back here. You see, there is some small discrepancy because we assume that the potential is polynomial, but we want to differentiate over all t. In principle, even before people avoid uh, somehow, uh, but pass over this uh, difficulty by uh, producing considerations that we first unfreeze all times, then we differentiate, then we freeze again times back, setting higher times equal to zero. But if you do just this change of variable integration, you are you can just work with, uh, with uh, the same potential. There, there is no nothing to change here. The potential is not changed. It's just that we make this uh, change of variables and it's immediately uh, produce this equation. Uh, but indeed, if you want, we can do this small exercise on the whiteboard. Ah, uh, it's pretty much, no, it's really small, it's just that, because uh, again, in this case, we can do the variation of H of the matrix, and the variation of H will be epsilon 1 over H minus X. Then we have the integral over DH, and we need to produce And obviously, we need to derive the measure 
and the potential. The variation of the potential, it just follows immediately. So it's more or less minus n v prime of h with a trace 1 over h minus x. And with variation of uh, hard measure, we need a little uh, more precise work. But nevertheless, it's uh, because this is uh, more or less the product over i and j. Then we can easily find out that or it's more or less it's a wedge product of all this of all these uh, edges and then when I do the variation uh, actually I must uh, take into account this uh, how to put it it's uh, First of all, I have this, this uh, double property. So actually, it's uh, what we get at the end of the day that this will be dh by itself times uh, product of traces. Oh, two times, yes, because we have real and imaginary part. And this, in this, what what produces finally the equation? Because uh, this will be uh, w two x x plus because it also contains disjoint part plus w one square x. So this this obviously gives this part. And after some um, small ch uh, here we do. A very simple trick: we subtract and net v prime of x over h minus x. And in this term, you easily recognize this one. And this is good. And this term, why it's good? Because when we consider the polynomials, they kill the h minus x in the denominator. So we, uh, so this part is actually polynomial in x, always. And, and this is good. Why? Because now what we do, we disregard the correction term because we have the uh, factor 1 over n squared with this term. And then if I consider this equation for w1, for w1 in uh, genus 0 on the sphere, then again we just make a small shift by v prime of by one half of v prime and then for this quantity y of x we immediately obtain algebraic equation just quadratic equation you see the y square of x and here there is some polynomial potential this PD minus 1 is precisely this part. Well, to, 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 to take, uh, to speak precisely the, uh, the, the leading term of this part, because this part also has its own expansion in 1 over n. But all these terms are obviously just polynomials in every order. Polynomials of fixed degree. Of uh, well, if uh, v prime is of degree d, then this is of degree d minus one, and so the, this uh, gives us a, just the a standard algebraic equation determining the spectral curve, and in this case, it's just a hyperelliptic spectral curve. Uh, If uh, it, uh, well, first of all, it's just a spectral curve. <laughs> Second of all, uh, if we consider uh, some, some real part of this, then uh, 
if we have a potential, then we have branch points somewhere, for instance, and on the real line we have a distribution of eigenvalues defined by by this formula. Outside, well, usually the distribution is given by the real part of this, of this square root. Or, in, oh no, imaginary part. Usually we have a, a normalization uh, of real condition at infinity. Uh, because it, well, because it is a correlation function. It is a correlation function, and if I consider this, I have, well, it's a hyperelliptic spherical curve. That means that on the real line, we have uh, several intervals of discontinuity, several intervals where we have a jump. And the distribution of eigenvalues is determined by precisely this jump. And, simul and simultaneously, it's imaginary part of this, of this expression. So, indeed, it's... Uh, why? Uh, be, no, 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 because, uh, again, that's, uh, that's what we have, that if I have uh, uh, the correlation function, then I especially say that X is outside the domain of distribution. So when I approach from two sides, I obtain precisely the distribution itself by the spectral theorem. Again, if we, again, uh, so if we have, uh, So, um, if I want uh, to consider any quantity, the mean of any quantity, whatever, let's call it some new non-metric psi, then it's given by the integral over some uh, contour, CD of psi rho psi, uh, psi of uh, S rho of S. Right? At the same time, I can write it as an integral over some contour that goes around these cuts of W1 of x uh, uh, psi of x dx, like that. And this means that if and this is the same as to write that it's an integral over between this mu i and mu i plus 1, no matter 2i, 2i plus 1, and sum over all i from 1 to, to g plus 1, because in g no 0 case we have one interval of uh, imaginary part y of x times psi of x dx. Now, oh, there are some different considerations that basically produce the same answer. Okay, so... Uh, what is probably more interesting what, what was understood only at the, in this century. So this, uh, actually, the, the first paper by Doi Graf and Waffer was, I think, in 2001 or 2002, is that the same uh, objects, they are containing some geometry inside, some geometrical engineering that we can use to extract some more information that we didn't expect, say, when, because I was in this, in this business starting, oh, wow, already, like, for the quarter of century. And this was quite a new insight those days, I remember. 
So if we take, again, if we take what we call the flat variables or independent variables, again, these tk are times or coefficients of the potential, but we supply them also with integrals over a cycles or over the cycles that go around these cuts uh, of this uh, form y, y dx. Then, it looks like a miracle, but the calculation again is very simple. If we differentiate this y dx over these variables, we obtain what is called the canonical holomorphic differentials on this hyperelliptic Riemann surface. Uh, so they are holomorphic and they have a canonical normalization uh, on A cycle. So integrals over AI of omega J is delta IJ. Uh, what we observe uh, with Andrei Mironov was that it, we can do more. We can also consider the differentiations with respect to this TK. And then we obtain what is called to wisdom creature meromorphic differentials. Uh, that's our differentials that have a prescribed behavior at infinity point. So they have a, a pure pool of some higher order there with no other corrections. And they also, they don't have other singularities and they have zero A cycle integrals. So that's what is called the canonical wisdom creature differentials. And moreover, we have exact uh, equations or uh, zyberg witten relations if we differentiate the free energy with respect to this SI, then we obtain the integrals over B cycles of, of this. And in this formula you probably recognize just the W1, the first loop mean. So when we, if we know the first loop mean, if we know the correlation function, it turns out that we know also the differentials of the free energy with respect to some other parameters. Uh, well, uh, honestly, no. Honestly, it's not the original integral. It's the integral in which we fix these quantities. We can do it, say, by introducing some uh, Lagrange multipliers. So, so it's not precisely the original. The original matrix model would correspond to the case where all these integrals are zeros. Because these integrals are differences in chemical potentials. And the, in the original in the original uh, formula, we expect that actually we are in a situation where these chemical potentials are equal. So we attain the genuine uh, minimum of the free energy. But in principle, even this proved to be wrong. The finally correct answer is that uh, actually to obtain the original matrix model integral, we, we can construct it from uh, these f's that satisfy this equation are uh, using some um, theta function technique developed by uh, Einar uh, well, other guys from Saclay Francois David Bertrand Maynard and Francois David. But what we call the Doigraf Waffa, if we can call it Doigraf Waffa free energy, is a quantity that satisfies all these equations. And it happens that this quantity is precisely the quantity that we need in many, many problems. And, well, just the first outcome is that it's not that difficult to check that uh, for this F's, 
for f0, we have wdv equations. I don't want, because uh, again, it's, it's a little... Uh, a little aside of what I'm going to talk, so I just mention it. But in principle, indeed, you see that uh, these properties, uh, these quantities, they have some interesting and quite deep geometrical relations that are encoded in them. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, for instance, this relation is exact. Is exact. It holds in all genus. It's for all terms of the expansion. Uh, but what I want actually, I want to uh, find out how to produce the topological expansion in, in all orders. Or better to say, how we can solve uh, the the master loop equation to all orders and the first well the first ingredient was this uh, Riemann surface that we got and two differentials dx and dy second and very important ingredient is of course this one what is this what is this guy the two point relation function And for it turned out it, it was observed again in the 90s and it was amazing observation that was called the universality property. It turned out that this function is very simple indeed. And it was like, like a miracle those days. But if we uh, use this geometrical engineering, then you'll see what will happen. So first of all I formulate uh, the notion of the Bergman, well, uh, it's a Berg. Well, it, again, this uh, two differential has many names. Again, Bergman is uh, probably abusive name that was introduced by physicists. Nevertheless, it uh, somehow survived, and we call it the Bergman by differential, symmetric Bergman by differential. So it's symmetric with respect to exchange of two arguments, it has all A cycles equal to zero, and the determining property is that if we have two points on the Riemann surface, and these two points collide, then uh, this Bergman differential develops a second order pole, and this is the only singularity that we have. It's easy to see that with these conditions it's uniquely determined, and if we denote by y bar not the complex conjugate again by the point on the second sheet of the hyperelliptic curve uh, that will come later in the play for this Bergman curve we have a Riemann bilinear identities so if I integrate over B cycle of this quantity then I will get the holomorphic differential and you see it's already hints that it's somehow related to formulas on the previous slide. But it's even more than that. If I consider the residue at, inf at infinity of this B, uh, no, that must be, must be positive here, that plus K, otherwise it's zero, because there is no, no singularity here. Then we obtain the rhythm differentials. Uh, and the rhythm differentials, I recall, they are derivatives of y of x, and y of x itself is the main ingredient of the first order correlation function. Uh, so they are derivatives with respect to tk. So it's again a part of the loop insertion operator. And indeed, if I act by the loop insertion operator on y, uh, I obtain this difference of two Bergman kernels. The difference appears because we also have the uh, because uh, we also have uh, for the because we have a symmetry and when we differentiate the one point correlation function because we had the uh, correction with v prime there it actually uh, gives the same expression but with plus so this 
this, this term is killed and this term is doubled. So we observe that if we act by loop insertion operator on one point correlation function in zero order, then I obviously get two point correlation function in zero order, and this two point correlation function is related to the Bergman kernel. So we really identify the Bergman kernel with a two-point correlation function. And we have the second necessary ingredient for constructing the whole solution. Uh, and again, the universality property means that indeed this, this expression depends only on the Riemann surface and not on uh, these two special differentials that we, uh, that we also have in play. The third and the last missing ingredient is now the three point and high, of course higher point, point correlation functions as well, but we start with, three, with the three point correlation function. And again, it's, we can originate it from what is called the Rauch variational formulas for this Bergman kernel, where mu is a, a branch point. So if I differentiate with respect to branch point, this Bergman kernel splits into two. And finally, it's not that difficult to invert uh, this differentiation and to write it in terms of the loop insertion operator. So the final formula for the three-point correlation function in the leading order is given by the integral over this over these contours that, en en that enclose all, all intervals of uh, eigenvalue distributions uh, of the product of three Bergman kernels divided by d y d x i. Remember that I always assume that all these are uh, by differentials, so we have precisely the Proper uh, the proper one differential in, in Xi. What is really amazing is that instead of writing the integral in this expression, we can pop it on the branch points themselves. So it's indeed local. So instead of writing it in the integral form, I can just write it as a sum of residues in the corresponding branch points. So everything is localized here. Uh, and what else I will do, because uh, the word, we have just a simple, simple pool here in this expression at the branch point, I can integrate it a little bit. So I, can, I want to spoil this, ex, this nice expression, to spoil it and write it in some non-symmetric form. So I integrate one, one, of this term, one of these b's on the top and I integrate dy on the bottom between uh, two points. One will be on the physical and the other will be on the unphysical sheet of the corresponding Riemann surface. Why? Well, it will be clear in a moment. So this was a trick invented by NR. And uh, so the, same, the very same expression I can write in this form. And why? Because this part that is in red here, uh, turn out to be a recursion kernel. That is, it's the, the, the kernel that is inverse to the operation of multiplication by y of x on the Riemann surface. Uh, and uh, this dxi plays the role of some uh, actually projection operator. So it's, uh, it is responsible for this, the, for that this multiplication occurs on the Riemann surface and not just on the complex plane. Uh, yes, so, so we have this d10 differential and then we have everything because now we can invert the action of this and then we can develop the whole actually expansion into all orders of all correlation functions. 
So the message is that three-point correlation functions can be always written in terms of two-point correlation functions and one-point correlation function. And all higher correlation functions have the same property. Yes. Um, well, uh, what is my honest belief is that uh, actually for a, it's it's very it's very gen that's what I want to convince you today that it's very very general property because because it appears in a lot of seemingly unrelated problems. Uh, vaguely speaking, the we we need just maybe two two starting points. We need uh, either conformal symmetry that we have here, because if I come back to the origin, this uh, master loop equation, the other form of writing it, it's uh, to present it as a, it's also the generating function for Virasoro conditions on the corresponding integrals. It might be that it's not Virasoro, it might be that it's cut and join operations like in Hurwitz numbers, but we must have some uh, some infinite series, half infinite series of symmetries. First, and second, well, symmetries of uh, second order differential operators, uh, expressed like uh, is in the form of second order differential operators. And we must be able to solve the problem in the leading, in the leading order. So we must be able to produce some, what is, well, it might be not even the Riemann surface, but it might, it's, actually some relation between two differentials that we have. And seemingly this is all we need. Because after that this machinery uh, works and we can produce all terms of the expansion. Just from these two, uh, well, two basic and two basic facts which actually appears in many, many models. Okay, so I'm always done. So now I just describe what what we got. So there are some references where we saw this. Uh, so in our first found in this paper the correlation function of one matrix models uh, with his student Nicolas Rampon. They found the correlation functions of two matrix models in the first approach. Then we were able to produce the free energy because. The most interesting and puzzling part is that the most difficult, most difficult uh, part of the play is producing the free energy. Because we have a regular technique for constructing correlation functions, but to produce the free energy we must be able to somehow invert this loop insertion operator. And this is, uh, well, tricky, but you will see on the second slide that how it can be solved in one matrix, in, in matrix models. But before this, uh, we also have a, a convenient graphical representation. So if I just denote these Bergman kernels by blue lines and denote this uh, kernel by the arrowed green line, because it's non-symmetric, obviously, between Z and Xi and T, sorry. Uh, then you see that uh, we can present the action of the loop insertion operator in this form. And when I act on this, it, it is written in this form. And what is also interesting is that arrows indicate the order of taking residues. So we always have a, a rooted sub three of these arrow propagators that shows us how we take the residues in, in what order. So we, to, we first to take the residue here and then take the residue there. So everything is prescribed and for instance here there are some examples of these diagrams 
for some quantities. Say here is the first correction to the uh, to the one point correlation function. It is given by by this diagram. Uh, the first correction to two point correlation function is the sum of two diagrams. Uh, the second correction to one point correlation function is the sum of three diagrams, but don't forget that actually if we know the branch points and we know this uh, differential y, then evaluating all these residues is, well, just put it on the computer and because everything is local here. You can, uh, and you need just to evaluate any term to any order, you need just finite uh, finite order expansion of y near the branch point. And this is what in old days were called the moment techniques. So, so we know that all corrections are some polynomials in moments of this matrix model. Now, how we can produce the free energy? Uh, that's what I promised. So we need a new operator that somehow is in inverse to the loop insertion operator. Well, it has this form and it's easy to, well, it's easy to see that it acts like erasing these lines in this picture. If it's, so if I act on the blue line, then here it erases it and gives just the, uh, the one green line. And if this is the last point, like here, then the action is just zero. So indeed, we can, using this operation, we can uh, construct one, uh, m point correlation function out of m plus 1. And also it has a nice commutation relations with the loop insertion operator. So, and it's easy, more or less easy to find out its action on, uh, so it's just pure combinatorics on action on, da on W2 of any order H is a homogeneous, is a homogeneous action, uh, well, uh, producing uh, one point correlation function. And from here, we can find out that the energy is given by the action of the one point correlation function created by this function. Of course, it doesn't produce you it's strange, it's actually, it works even for H0. For H equal 1, you see that there is some discrepancy here. So we must resolve it, but for F1, there are some other techniques that allows us to find out uh, the answer, and this answer is non-polynomial, so it always contains the logarithm of some tau function. But all other corrections, they are polynomials. To free energy, and that's it. So, for instance, the correction of the second order is given by this sum of three diagrams. And again, everything is local. Even this new vertex that appears here is a local because we have to integrate here from the uh, so from the branch point to some point. So it's not so difficult to find out what is the free energy itself from here. So here is a summary. And you see that, as I promised, everything fits just in one slide. So the summary of topological recursion. What do we need? What is a, actually, what we start with is a spectral curve plus two meromorphic differentials, dx and dy. Then we consider the correlation functions, and these are not the functions, in my understanding. It's, it's actually, we spent a lot of time and uh, there was a lot of sweat on this, because until we understood that we must consider these correlation functions as differentials, as, as M fold symmetric differentials. Because, and then everything fits well, so we have uh, these correlation functions in the space of M symmetric differentials. They all have this expansion with some formal parameter H bar. 
Sometimes you see the necessary ingredients, the absolutely necessary ingredients are in red. Uh, the optional ingredients are in black. So we need some master loop equation expressing conformal invariance, or we need some other equation. We need some flat variables, or maybe some other variables. But what we definitely need, we need zyberg witten and wiesen creature relations that relate this y dx. Uh, that express the differentials of y dx in terms of the holomorphic differentials and meromorphic differentials on this spectral curve or Riemann surface. Then we have the two-point correlation function that is universal. So it's given by the Bergman kernel. Third, we must have the recursion kernel. And fourth, we must have the whatever residue or integral formula for the three-point correlation function, which must be expressed in terms of this uh, recursion kernel and in terms of two two-point correlation functions. And, of course, this expression must be totally symmetric, otherwise we lost. So if we check all these properties, then we need to say, oh, huh? now I can produce everything. Now I can produce all correlation functions to all orders in, in this particular model. Uh, again, if we are lucky and we have an extra H operator that actually maps the point of M plus 1 differentials to the space of M differentials and is inverse to the loop insertion operator such that it commutes on some identity, then we also may define what is called symplectic invariance or terms of the free energy here by this formula. And yes, and this, uh, this technique appears to be quite powerful. Just to, I will just show you some examples and then we'll finish because this is the main, the main message for today. That we have special technique which, however, not very special because it can be applied to the probably to zillions of problems. I even was unable to 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 enlist all problems where it was applied already in the last five years. So, for instance, we solved using this the two matrix model. In the two matrix model, where we have a potential of this form, and let's assume that uh, these v1 and v2 are again polynomials. Uh, the, we have the algebraic spectral curve. So you see now it's indeed, it, it's not of order 2 in any of these variables. It's of some higher order in X and higher order in Y, but it's a polynomial expression. And that's it. So you see that as soon as we have the spectral curve first, and we have this X and Y second, we have everything. So we can produce using these formulas the correlation functions and free energy for two matrix models, for two matrix models that we did. In uh, 2006 with uh, ANR and Orenton. And moreover, you see that because uh, this expression is obviously symmetric with respect to replacing H1 and H2, we can also uh, play on changing y and x. So in principle it doesn't matter uh, which variable we take as a defining variable. When we evaluate of course not correlation functions, correlation functions are different, but when we evaluate the free energy, free energies must be obviously symmetric under the, this change of, of differentials. And in principle it's, it's uh, it so the free energy is invariant uh, under all transformations that preserve this form, dx, wedge, dy. Then, okay, so, so you see there were uh, other problems that were solved using this was holomorphic anomaly equation. It's NR, Marini, Aranton. It's when we play with the normalization of Bergman kernels because I always considered some uh, standard normalization to A cycles. If we consider something different, 
likewise here, so we add some term uh, composed out of holomorphic differentials, and for instance, such that these coefficients k uh, are related to the period matrix. Then uh, it's it will be non-analytic. You see, we have here t bar is really complex conjugate, but for the for the price of this small non-analyticity, we obtain what is called the Schiffer kernel. Uh, this is a kernel which is normalized such that integrals over all, imaginary part of integrals over all cycles are zeros. So it's automatically modular, modular invariant. And that was the interplay between this and holomorphic anomaly equations in strings that I don't want to tell about, but just to say that uh, it was possible to solve these equations using the same technique. Then, as I promised, we have a Konsevich matrix model. It's a matrix model with external field lambda. And here we have uh, Riemann surface parameterized by z, where x of z is just z square, y of z is this expansion. And we have just one branch point around which we develop all the, all the expansion. There was a model for wild Peterson volumes uh, proposed first by Mir Zakhani and then uh, in our found that it's possible also to solve this model using the very same technique, but it just now you have uh, the same x of z, but y of z is some sine function. There was uh, produced a model that generate what is called simple Hurwitz numbers. I don't have a time to describe this, but just to say that there is again some special equation. It is called cut and joint equation, and it's equation of the second order. And developing back this equation, it's possible to produce a Riemann surface, which is not a Riemann surface right now, because it's what is called Lambert curve, Lambert equation. But again, if we have just one branch point at y equal 1, and we can develop the same expansion around this branch point, and we produce all these simple Hurwitz numbers. And again, as I say, it's not the end of the story, definitely, because uh, now are developing many other models describing at least part of Gromov-Witten invariants, some uh, higher Hurwitz numbers, and so forth and so forth. So it's really very uh, actively developing branch of science, but just to say that you come back here, it's all based, it can be all formulated in terms of this one slide. So, I think that I will, of course, I don't have time to speak about anything else today, but, but if this message was clear enough, I'm happy. Okay, thank you very much.